The Case of the Mummy's Hand, written and read by David Longhorn. In depositing this third manuscript in the vault of my trusted bankers, I act with some trepidation. However, I feel I must provide for future generations some account of the cases that I could not, in all conscience, submit to the Strand magazine. I have already told the truth, so far as I could, about the mystery of the yellow sign and the horror of the Garmouth swimmers, and therefore I here set down another strange tale, perhaps the strangest of all, and one which is, I fear, far from concluded. It began one fine morning in the early April of 1899. I returned to 221B Baker Street from a very early house call on a patient to find that Holmes had undertaken a new case. There had been something of a hiatus in my friend's career over the winter, following a flurry of activity in the summer of 1898. I have already set down the cases of the dancing men and the retired colourman, both of which presented fascinating problems for my friend's prodigious intellect. However, since those adventures, only a few minor problems had presented themselves. Holmes had become restless and bored. I feared he would resort to drugs to numb the frustration of inactivity. I was therefore pleased to find my friend puffing meditatively on his trusty meerschaum, a sure sign that he had a problem to solve. I could just make him out sitting by the fireplace amid a cloud of blue-grey smoke. Resisting the urge to open a window, for it was a bright, mild morning, I asked Holmes what had materialised. In reply, he pointed at the table with the stem of his pipe. Consider that cedarwood box, Watson, or more precisely, consider its contents. I had noticed the box in question already. At first glance, it was unremarkable. When I picked it up, I saw a printed label bearing the word Alexandria. I lifted the lid to find, resting on a piece of folded and rather dirty cloth, a human hand. Another man might have been more than a little annoyed, but I wasn't offended by what may have been taken to be a tasteless prank. I knew Holmes too well to suspect him of vulgar japery. "'What does your trained medical mind tell you about that particular appendage, Watson?' he asked. "'I'm sure you will notice a few distinguishing features.' Now that I could see it more clearly, I did wonder if Holmes was poking fun just a little. Any village idiot would have noticed that there were six fingers, or rather. Rather than state the obvious, however, I decided to play along. I carried the box to the window, where the light was better, then carefully removed the hand. When I touched the parchment-like skin, I felt a very odd jolt of what seemed like static electricity. It was peculiar, but I thought nothing of it at the time. I was, I confess, fatigued. I had been attending to a difficult case since well before dawn. "'Well, Holmes,' I said, balancing the horrid object on my palm, "'I think very little medical expertise is needed to see that this hand is, from its size, probably that of a woman or a child, rather than a grown man. Its desiccated and blackened condition suggests that its owner did not die very recently. To produce this state requires exposure to strong heat, coupled with a lack of humidity, conditions we would be unlikely to find in England.' I paused, waiting for Holmes to react to what I had not said. Eventually he chuckled, stood up, and joined me at the window. "'I see your game, Watson, and I applaud your sporting approach. But please rest assured that I did not mean to insult you with my question. The most noticeable thing is the one upon which I genuinely would like your considered opinion.' I smiled, turned the repellent object over, then put it back in its box and offered it to Holmes. Polydactyly, I said, supernumerary fingers or toes. In this case, the sixth finger is quite well developed. I would say that the lady, or child, might have used it to full effect. It does not look vestigial. That would have made the person a remarkably accomplished pianist, I suppose, especially if they had six fingers on both hands. Holmes gave his short bark of a laugh at that and relieved me of the box. Then he did something which struck me as odd. He closed the lid and locked the box with a small brass key which he placed in the pocket of his dressing gown. Then he placed the box on the table. "'Are you afraid Mrs. Hudson will open it out of curiosity?' I asked. I could think of no other reason why he should lock it, and yet our housekeeper had always been the soul of discretion. Seeing my puzzlement, Holmes laughed again. Mm, "'My new client insists that the box be kept locked when the hand is not being examined,' he said, "'just in case it becomes frisky and makes a nuisance of itself.' For a moment I was even more baffled. Then I grasped his meaning, and it was my turn to laugh. Holmes, I see you're in a frivolous mood. Perhaps, he mused, sitting down again. 
but Sir Henry Hardcastle would disagree. The name rang a bell. After a moment I recalled the previous year's sensational newspaper coverage of some finds on the Upper Nile. Hardcastle was an archaeologist who claimed to have uncovered an early Egyptian tomb. I looked again at the box. Precisely, Watson, chuckled my friend. The lady in question never got a chance to learn the pianoforte or any other instrument of our era. She died, according to Sir Henry, some four thousand years ago. Or at least she is supposed to have died. But it seems nobody thought to apprise the lady's hand of the change to its circumstances. Sir Henry thinks it still has some life in it. I gazed at the box, then back at Holmes. As he never played practical jokes, I assumed that his new client must have contracted some form of brain fever from spending too long in the Egyptian sun. But when I said this, Holmes shook his head. I doubt it, Watson. Sir Henry was certainly agitated when he visited me just after breakfast, but I did not get the impression of an unbalanced mind. Far from it. He seemed extremely clear-headed, but also frightened. There is a notable difference between the agitation produced by fear and the unrest produced by lunacy. I had to agree, of course, but I pointed out that in my military service I'd seen men driven to the brink of insanity by terror. Perhaps, I hazarded, some Egyptian nationalists had threatened Sir Henry for, as they saw it, plundering their country's treasures. Holmes nodded judiciously. That was my first thought when he told me he feared his life was in danger, Watson. It is possible that such villains could have followed him to England with murder in mind, and perhaps the retrieval of the artefacts from the tomb, of which there are many. I paused, sensing a however in the offing, and said so. However, Holmes said, Sir Henry thinks that some supernatural element is involved. He did not say so, not in so many words, but he did talk of inexplicable events, such as that hand being a lot livelier than any one should be after spending a few millennia in the grave. I shook my head at the absurdity of the idea. It flew against all medical signs and common sense, and I said so. I left unspoken, however, my knowledge that on two previous instances Holmes had been wrong about the supernatural. No, Watson, Holmes continued, I fear that Sir Henry, while accomplished in his own field, is somewhat naive about the ways of conjurers and mountebanks. Someone is attempting to convince our archaeologist that he is under a curse. They are using some form of trickery, perhaps even hypnosis. Then, if he's murdered, it will look like the result of the curse. The effect may well deter further exploration of Egypt's historic sites, a propaganda victory for those who seek to undermine the empire. I understand, Holmes, I said, but has Sir Henry told anyone else about his fears? I don't recall anything in the papers. Excellent, Watson, Holmes exclaimed, puffing out a choking cloud of tobacco smoke. I see your fatigue has not taken the edge off your mind. Sir Henry has confided to a few close friends, but he is a bachelor, so there is no lady in the case to spread tittle-tattle. This may explain why he's still alive, in fact. If my theory is correct, when the press gets hold of this story, his fate will be sealed. Once publicised, the curse must be seen to work, which is why we must act swiftly. While it seemed likely that my friend's theory of Egyptian assassins was correct, I was still uneasy. The odd sensation I received from touching the hand seemed to linger. I found myself rubbing my own hands together as if to wipe away some kind of invisible stain. Has he actually been threatened, Holmes? I asked, keen to focus on mundane facts. Is there any evidence of imminent danger? Holmes shrugged. Sir Henry thinks he is being followed and watched. He claims that people, number and nature unspecified, gain entrance to his London apartment at night. He has, he claims, felt a presence, even seen movements in the shadows, but when he turns up the gas, there is no one there. That hand, he claims, moves of its own volition when nobody is watching it. He decided to stay at his club, but he felt this mysterious intruder there, too. I suggested that he move out of London and stay in the country somewhere. I recommended somewhere obscure within two hours of London, but not on the main railway line. Sir Henry has a cousin who owns a cottage at Sebra in Norfolk. He's now making arrangements to go there. I intend to join him on his journey and put that hand back into his, so to speak. This plan to decamp to the coast surprised me. I recalled his view that at least in a teeming city like London a cry for help would get an immediate response, whereas in a remote district all sorts of evil might be perpetrated in secret. Quite so, Watson, he responded when I reminded him, but in this case we have an exception. Consider, a swarthy Egyptian fanatic would stand out like a sore thumb in an English coastal town. Still more conspicuous would be a group of them. 
In London, however, men of all races gather to do business, legal or otherwise. No face really stands out in our great metropolis. I had to concede the point. At that moment, Mrs. Hudson came in with a splendid late breakfast for me. I thanked her warmly, and conversation turned to the weather and the condition of my patient until she had departed. After that, Holmes asked me if I might be free to join him in Norfolk. "'I really do value your opinion, Watson,' he insisted. "'I think Sir Henry is a sane, if somewhat excitable man, fallen prey to superstition. You may form a different view.' "'My locum can handle things for a few days,' I said. "'Apart from this morning, I have not had many demands on my time. My last serious case was a fellow whose valet quit unexpectedly. Despite having a responsible post in a government department, the gentleman proved unable to cope.' He came to see me in some distress, after attempting to iron a shirt while he was still wearing it. I sent a note to my locum via one of the messenger boys who hang around Baker Street. Then Holmes asked me to get down his index file on Egypt, with particular emphasis on ancient relics and native unrest. He was soon immersed in the so-called Eastern question, looking into the politics of it all. Holmes was in his element, collating data on complex matters that permitted of rational analysis. I found the archaeology more to my taste. I leafed through newspaper clippings about the expeditions of Sir Henry Hardcastle. He was clearly an Egyptologist of the highest standing, having made several donations to the British Museum. However, I noticed that his most recent discovery had not been without controversy. Sir Henry's claim that he'd found the tomb of the last pharaoh of the Old Kingdom period had been greeted with some scepticism. The cause was twofold. Firstly, Hardcastle had not found a mummy, only an elaborately decorated underground chamber. It was certainly a very old tomb, said sceptics, but that was all. It could never have been put to use. Sir Henry had responded that the tomb had probably been ransacked at some point, which would explain the scarcity of finds. This, the more intelligent newspapers observed, paralleled the case of the Great Pyramid of Cheops. When that was open, no body was found, yet no one doubted that the pyramid was a royal tomb. I paused at this point, wondering why I had not seen any reference to the mummified hand. I riffled through the clippings again. There were accounts of wall paintings and a stone sarcophagus containing no mummy case. I wondered if Sir Henry had found the hand and kept it as a kind of grotesque trophy, secretly gloating that he did in fact have evidence of a body. But that seemed unlikely, for a man of his reputation. It did seem clear that the hand had influenced his views, however, the second criticism levelled at Sir Henry was his claim that the tomb had belonged to a female pharaoh. This woman, he averred, had ruled Egypt at the very end of the Old Kingdom period. Some rival experts had scoffed at this, and demanded to know on what authority he based his claim. He cited two sources, the Greek historian Herodotus and an Egyptian priest called Menetho. The sceptics were not appeased. Hmm, interesting, I suppose, if you like scientific controversies, I muttered. Have you found anything about political threats against Hardcastle? My friend grunted in a negative fashion, then he stood up and went to the table again, but this time picked up the morning papers. No, nothing of any real value in my index, Watson. Instead, I think I will catch up with the day's news and let the problem simmer, and you, my friend, should perhaps rest a while. You were called out at a most ungodly hour. He was right, of course. I retired to my little bedroom for a nap. As was my habit, I took off my shoes and lay on the bed fully clothed, just in case I was called out again. I reflected as I began to doze on the strange turn of events that had led to my friendship with Holmes. I'd merely been an ex-army doctor, newly returned from the Afghan war, seeking lodging in London while I found my feet in civilian practice. How odd that such a mundane quest should have led to so many extraordinary adventures. Then I thought of my late beloved wife. I would not have met and loved and lost my Mary, had it not been for Holmes. I saw my angel's sweet, wise face in my mind's eye, as I do whenever I pause to reflect in solitude. I may have shed a tear. Shakespeare avers that it is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. I am not so sure of that. Then another woman's face replaced that of my dear departed. It was somewhat reminiscent of Holmes' brilliant rival, Irene Adler, though darker in complexion, and this face was altogether haughtier than Miss Adler's, with proud, flaring nostrils and a direct, confident gaze. Her eyes were the most remarkable feature of this striking woman. They were huge and dark, outlined with some black concoction. 
Her lips were full and painted a deep red. She was beautiful, but I sensed she was well aware of this, and was also very bold. I was not especially alarmed by this, I must stress. I knew I'd drifted off and was dreaming, but what happened next was disconcerting. The dream woman spoke. I couldn't make out any words, at least not at first, but her voice was melodious, strong, and it confirmed my view of her as a woman used to command. As she continued to speak, I suddenly found that the strange tongue had become comprehensible, or she had switched to English. Either way, I could grasp some words, though they made little sense. Set me free, physician, that I may heal you. I woke with a start, and, consulting my pocket watch, found that nearly three hours had passed. I heard a sound of movement in the living room, but when I went through I found that Holmes was gone. I noted the absence of his coat and hat. I was not puzzled, however, as the sound I'd heard might have come through the floor from the lodger in apartment 221A. I assumed that Holmes had ventured forth to consult with the street urchins, his Baker Street irregulars, who so often furnished him with information. I picked up the papers and took my customary chair to await my friend's return. I had barely glanced at the headlines, however, when something odd struck me. I was almost certain that the box had been left in the middle of the table. Now it stood near one edge. It was not like Holmes to be so sloppy, but who else could have moved it? I thought again of the muffled bumping sounds I'd attributed to our neighbour. I pondered Sir Henry Hardcastle's belief that the hand was capable of independent motion. The idea was absurd, but I still picked up the box to examine it. Holmes' remarks about professional magicians had piqued my interest. Perhaps the box had a false bottom, containing some clockwork mechanism? No, no, I snorted. The idea was ridiculous. I was about to put the box down in the middle of the table when I felt a movement inside. I almost dropped it in sudden panic, then laughed at my foolishness. It was obvious that the hand had simply shifted due to my jolting the box slightly. I resumed my reading of the papers, and yet I could not concentrate. I found my gaze constantly straying to the table where the box lay. Holmes had flung his dressing gown onto the chair after his usual fashion. I retrieved the key and opened the box. The mummified hand lay inert and blackened with time. It was not a pleasant sight, and yet I felt my own hand straying into the box as if of its own volition. Once more I touched that long dead skin and again I shuddered slightly at the contact in a most unprofessional way. At that moment I had the overwhelming sensation that someone was standing behind me. The hairs on the back of my neck rose. I was sure that the intruder, whoever it was, was close enough to reach out and touch me. I straightened up, the hand forgotten, and glanced at the mirror that hung by the window. For a fleeting moment I thought I glimpsed a tall figure, a face with huge dark eyes and an arm reaching out, a slender, light brown arm that ended in a blackened stump. I'm sure I cried out something, but I forget what. I was possessed by an intense horror of being touched by that maimed limb. I leapt sideways, avoiding the table, but almost falling as I tripped over the rug, and I turned to face the door. There was, of course, nobody there. I heard Holmes coming in downstairs, his deep voice greeting Mrs. Hudson. I composed myself, locked the box, and put the key back in Holmes' dressing gown. The game's afoot, my friend declared as he burst in, full of his accustomed energy. My irregulars had already observed the arrival of a party that certainly fits our bill. He handed me a flyer of the cheap sort that are handed out on every other street corner in London. I read it with growing comprehension. It advertised a group of musicians and dancers newly arrived from Egypt. The Karim troupe were due to perform at a seemingly respectable theatre in the West End. I observed that, judging by the lurid drawing of a so-called belly dancer that took up half the page, that they were an unlikely band of assassins. Unless, I added, this striking young lady intends to endanger Sir Henry by raising his blood pressure to a hazardous level. Holmes gave another mirthless laugh. The musicians in such companies, I think you will find, are often young men, he pointed out, and such men may well carry curved daggers in plain sight as part of their exotic costume. Still, if this group of performers makes a foray to the Norfolk coast, they will be noticed. That much is certain. I knew from his tone that my friend was still not entirely sure of Sir Henry's safety. He confirmed this when he told me he'd booked tickets on the Great Eastern Railway for ourselves and the archaeologist. Holmes had sent a note to Sir Henry that we would be travelling together with minimal preparation. 
we were to meet him at Liverpool Street Station in half an hour. "'You still have your revolver, Watson?' he asked me. "'I will be taking mine?' "'Of course,' I replied, heading into my room. I quickly checked that my old Webley was loaded, then put a half-full box of cartridges into my portmanteau. But as I secreted the revolver in the pocket of my coat, I thought of the mummified hand and the dream woman. What if Sir Henry was right, and the menace we faced was supernatural in nature? Would a point four five bullet avail against such a threat? I shook off these worrying intimations and picked up my bag. Through my window I could hear Holmes out in the street, flagging down a handsome cab. I had my duty to perform. London traffic was against us, and we arrived at the station with barely five minutes to spare. Holmes' client was already on the platform. Sir Henry Hardcastle proved to be a short, stocky man of around fifty, with pepper-and-salt side whiskers. He had bright blue eyes, expressive hands, and talked rapidly. He was accompanied by a taciturn Egyptian servant called Abdul, who was placing his master's luggage in our private compartment. "'I see, Sir Henry,' said Holmes, "'that you do not travel light even when journeying in your own country.' Sir Henry muttered something about keeping certain items close by, for fear of burglars. Then he gazed at me with some suspicion. "'This is my friend, Dr. John Watson,' Holmes explained. "'I told you of his courage and resourcefulness earlier today.' "'Ah, yes,' said Sir Henry, extending his hand to me. "'Good to meet you, Doctor.' The whistle of the guard told us that there was no time for more pleasantries, and we climbed aboard. As the train pulled out, Holmes informed Sir Henry of his findings. He added that he'd sent a note to Inspector Lestrade at Scotland Yard, asking him to look into the affairs of the Karim troop. Sir Henry nodded somewhat abstractedly as Holmes talked, then he asked about the hand. "'It is in my bag,' Holmes said, glancing up at the luggage rack. "'Quite safe, I assure you. I don't know what trickery has been wrought on you, Sir Henry, but rest assured a dead hand cannot come back to life. Watson will testify to that.' Sir Henry looked from me to Holmes and back, then shook his head. "'You don't understand,' he said. He gazed out of the carriage window as the train bore us through the outer suburbs of London. Then he began to talk. "'In this modern city, in this world of the steam engine and the telegraph, it is easy to forget that earlier civilizations had their own sciences, sciences that might seem strange and even ridiculous to us, but were perhaps more advanced in some ways.' Holmes looked at me with a slight smile. "'You think a disembodied hand could be revived by science, Sir Henry?' he asked, with a hint of contempt. The archaeologist looked at Holmes, and I saw in his features a man of strong convictions allied to a powerful intellect. I had, I realised, formed an opinion of Sir Henry from press reports that fell short of the reality. He was altogether more impressive than the unworldly academic I'd imagined. Nitocris, said Sir Henry, "'I believe what I found was the tomb of Nitocris. He paused, evidently, to wait for our reactions. I'd never heard the strange name before, but like many scientific men, the archaeologist seemed to believe the whole world shared his obsessions. "'Please explain in more detail, sir,' said Holmes, speaking for us both. "'Imagine you are addressing people almost entirely ignorant of ancient Egyptian dynasties.' Sir Henry looked mildly astonished at the thought such people could exist, but then he embarked on a cogent account of his theories and discoveries. Nitocris, he explained, was mentioned by Herodotus, one of the most reliable of Greek sources. She was supposed to have been the last queen of the Old Kingdom, after which Egypt fell into a period of chaos until the Middle Kingdom arose. An Egyptian priest of the Ptolemaic era called Menetho also mentioned a notorious female pharaoh of that name. "'I sense from your tone,' said Holmes, "'that the lady was not well liked.' Sir Henry gave a humorless laugh. Nitocris is said to have taken over the throne after the assassination of her brother, who was also her husband, he explained. Her first deed as ruler was to invite her brother's murderers to a banquet. This was ostensibly to show her forgiveness. The feast was held in an underground chamber. When all the guests were gathered, Nitocris had the doors closed and barred, then opened hidden floodgates to drown her enemies in the waters of the Nile. She was utterly ruthless. Holmes seemed to find the story mildly amusing. I remarked that ancient monarchs were often unpleasant. I cited a few Roman emperors, contrasting their depravity with the life of our own dear queen. Sir Henry agreed, but insisted that Nitocris was exceptionally wicked. Like Cleopatra, who might have been her descendant, the female pharaoh was beautiful and intelligent, using her charms to disarm her enemies before she struck. But she was also reputedly a sorceress of extraordinary power. At this point, Holmes held up a finger in stern rebuke. 
Sir Henry, if you must regale us with Egyptian fairy tales, please make them brief and keep to the point. The archaeologist reddened at that, but did not protest. According to Herodotus, he said, Nitocris was eventually overthrown and fled her enemies into a mysterious chamber she'd created. This was referred to as a, a burning room. Herodotus theorizes that she committed suicide painlessly by inhaling some sort of toxic vapor. I thought of the hundreds of unfortunates who take their own lives by gas every year in London, and nodded. Seems plausible, I remarked. Sir Henry gazed out of the window. Yes, I thought so, but then I found her hand. There's a persistent legend that Nitocris had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. This is linked to occult power in many cultures, and shortly after that I found the burning room. Holmes interrupted. You found a chamber filled with poison gas? After four thousand years? No, Mr. Holmes, I did not. There was no gas, no flame, not in the earthly sense. I found something, something wonderful, strange, terrifying. I found proof that Nitocris escaped her enemies, but not completely. The burning room was, I think, a kind of, of a portal. She used her knowledge of, let us call it occult science, to move into some other dimension of time and space. I noticed that Abdul, who had been sitting quietly in the corner, glanced at his master quite sharply. The man was clearly concerned. Was it for Sir Henry's mental health, his reputation, or something else? Gentlemen, said Sir Henry, clearly struggling to contain his emotions. I was alone in the outer tomb except for Abdul. The native workmen would not come inside. It was, they said, long known to be an evil place. None had dared to rob it. Holmes made a sceptical noise at that, but Sir Henry continued regardless. The tomb was not filled with the usual items to be used by the pharaoh in the afterlife, though there was a simple sarcophagus. I think now this was because it was repurposed by Nitocris when she realised she could not hold on to power. I explored the outer chamber, and then Abdul drew my attention to what seemed like an inner door, a great stone slab. There was no handle, no means of ingress that I could see, but then I pushed against the slab and it gave a little. It pivoted and proved to be hinged in the middle. Together we shoved at one side, and, such was the incredible skill of those ancient workmen, the door swung open. By this stage I was leaning forward, breathless with anticipation. I forgot the Essex countryside rolling by outside the compartment. I had a sudden intense vision of that lamp-lit tomb and the dark rectangle of the open doorway. We went inside and found ourselves in a corridor leading to another door. This inner door was made of bronze, totally uncorroded after nearly four millennia. It was decorated with hieroglyphs referring to a great pharaoh, but giving no name. There were other symbols, ones unfamiliar to me, which was puzzling, but also exciting from a scientific viewpoint. This was truly a major discovery. We tried to swing the door open, but it was not hinged like the stone slab. However, when I touched it, I got a distinct, uh, call it a shock, as if some static electricity had passed through me. This jolted me out of my daydream, and I think I must have given a little cry of surprise. Three pairs of eyes turned to look at me. Abdul seemed particularly interested. I'm sorry, Sir Henry, I stammered in confusion. Uh, pray continue with your fascinating narrative. Well, said the archaeologist, after failing to find any way to open the door, we retreated to consider our options. I decided to pay off the native workers, as they would clearly be of no use. I considered bringing in a French engineer, an acquaintance from Cairo, who could be trusted not to talk. We emerged into the sunlight to find the workers had fled. Something had spooked them. Again, I was startled by a vivid mental picture of the scene. I saw Sir Henry and Abdul standing at the entrance to the outer tomb, surveying the abandoned camp. A cooking fire was still burning. Tents flapped in the breeze. What made this all the odder was that I saw this from behind, so to speak, as if I were standing at the tomb entrance, watching from the darkness. "'At least you saved some money, Sir Henry,' Holmes observed, again banishing my reverie. Was this when you first suspected you might be in danger? Sir Henry nodded and covered his face with his hands for a moment. Yes, he said, recovering his composure. I heard a sharp, metallic sound from inside the tomb and had the sudden overwhelming sense of being watched by some unseen observer. I decided to go back inside, leaving Abdul on watch. I lent him my revolver. Robbers sometimes attack excavations in remote areas, hoping to grab precious items, we had none, but at the time I felt some brigands might be observing us from behind some rocky outcropping. The scientist paused again, then looked Holmes in the eye. Mr. Holmes, the great bronze door, 
Two men had failed to shift, stood open. But that was not the thing that left me frozen in terror. No, Mr. Holmes, what astounded me was the light from inside the hidden chamber. Holmes spoke again. I assume there was some concealed opening to the surface that admitted sunlight? No, sir, responded Sir Henry emphatically. This was not the light of the sun. I had never seen such a light before, a strange radiance that seemed to be... And it was warm, radiating heat that made my skin prickle. He paused again. Once more I felt I'd been in the tomb with him, and again I saw Sir Henry, mouth open and eyes wide with wonderment, from the perspective of an observer a few yards away. This time the impression was brief, but I felt I understood what he meant by the nature of that inner light. "'Did you investigate further?' asked Holmes. The older man shook his head, and I saw a hint of shame on his face. "'I was afraid, Mr. Holmes. For the first time in my life I felt genuine primal fear.' I knew that inside that room was a being that was aware of my presence, and I felt the stress of its scrutiny, a mind that sensed my fear and perhaps even knew my very thoughts, and I turned and fled and summoned Abdul, and between us we closed the outer door. Thus sealing in the ghost of Queen Nitocris, said Holmes. Sir Henry looked very weary of a sudden, and slumped back in his seat. He closed his eyes and spoke so quietly I could barely hear him over the noise of the train. "'I cannot prove anything, Mr. Holmes,' he said, "'but I know what I saw, what I felt, "'and I know I was followed back to England by someone or something, "'and I know that the hand of Nitocris lives and moves "'in some monstrous, unholy fashion, "'and I fear I have aroused a vengeful spirit that will not relent.' "'Ah, yes, the hand,' Holmes said, "'quite a grisly trophy. "'You have yet to explain why the lady's hand was left "'outside her mysterious burning room, "'nor have you explained what the room might be.' Sir Henry opened his eyes. I think the hand was severed from her arm as she fled into the tomb, perhaps hacked off with a sword. Whoever pursued her did not destroy it, perhaps from fear. Instead, they sealed the hand in the tomb. He fell silent. The train reached a set of points and rattled over them. We were pulling into the station at Norwich, where we had to change to a local for Zebra. On the platform, where a porter helped us with our luggage, I felt that odd sensation of being watched. I glanced around, but saw no one other than normal passengers and railway personnel. Then I caught a glimpse of an altogether more exotic figure at the far end of the platform, standing close to the locomotive. I got the impression of a tall woman in white with long black hair. A great cloud of steam erupted from the engine, and when it cleared there was no one there. I hurried to catch up with the others, trying to focus on the task in hand. I tried to forget that one of the woman's arms had seemed oddly truncated. I knew I could not speak of visions or dreams to Holmes. He'd never concealed his contempt for the supernatural. What's more, this attitude made perfect sense for a consulting detective. After all, if magic is always permitted as an explanation, how can mere reason solve any mystery? So yet again I tried to dismiss the apparition, and instead spoke confidently of how safe Sir Henry would be at his cousin's cottage. Holmes outlined his theory about the Egyptian dance troupe, and Sir Henry seemed determined to put a brave face on things. He became less nervous as we took the small local train to Zebra. It's a pleasant town, and when we arrived, seemed somewhat sleepy, as the tourist season had hardly begun. We hired a small pony and trap, and quickly found our way to the cottage, located at the south end of Zebra. It stood on its own, set back from the road in a small garden. The only other building was the abandoned Martello Tower, built as a coastal defence during the war with Napoleon. Holmes, having checked the cottage interior and surroundings, pronounced himself satisfied. It would be almost impossible for an assailant to approach by daylight without being observed. The locks on doors and windows were sound enough. Holmes and I went back into town to book rooms at an inn, where we also dined. Discreet inquiries of the innkeeper unearthed no news of dark-skinned strangers in the vicinity. All seemed well. We returned to the cottage to find Sir Henry in a restless state, Night was drawing in, and it seemed that every room was lit by lamps or candles. This didn't so much banish the darkness as fill the place with flickering shadows. I tried to reassure Sir Henry, but Holmes questioned him further, increasing his nervousness. "'Sir Henry,' Holmes said eventually, "'if you fear the hand of Nitocris so much, why not simply dispose of it, donate it to the British Museum, or throw it in the sea, if it's a thing of evil?' The archaeologist's voice took on a despairing tone. "'Don't you think I've tried?' he demanded. "'I put it into a sealed jar and cast it overboard on the voyage home, "'but it returned to my cabin the following night. 
I can't get rid of the damn thing. Holmes caught my eye. I knew what he was thinking. By any reasonable standard, Sir Henry's claim was absurd. And yet I knew from my own experience that so-called supernatural phenomena could and did occur. I tried to calm Sir Henry, taking on the role of physician, and offered him a mild sedative. But before he could reply, a muffled cry came from somewhere nearby. Abdul! shouted Sir Henry, rushing out of the room. We followed, to find the servant lying on the floor of Sir Henry's bedroom, clutching his throat. The box lay on the floor. The lid was open. The hand was nowhere to be seen. But when I examined Abdul's throat, I saw six distinct indentations. The marks of a thumb, apparently, and five fingers. "'What is this ludicrous imposture?' said Holmes. But I could see he was baffled. "'The hand is free,' groaned Sir Henry, sinking onto the bed. "'Oh, God, it could be anywhere!' "'Sir Henry, I beg your forgiveness,' croaked Abdul, as I helped him to his feet. "'I have done you a great wrong.' The man's face was full of emotion. His once impassive manner quite vanished. We were all astonished, but Sir Henry spoke gently to his servant and asked him to explain what he'd done. I had determined that the man was not seriously injured and suffering from shock. I almost offered him a swig of brandy until I remembered that his faith forbade it. "'I found the hand while you were studying the wall painting, sir,' Abdul said, slumping into a chair by the bedside. "'And I remembered a story that my grandmother told me of the evil sorceress buried somewhere in the south. She said that this woman wore a special ring that was the source of her power. When I found the hand, I thought of this story, so I took the ring, lest you find it, and suffer harm. Then I pointed out the hand to you, sir. The rest you know.' The servant reached into his waistcoat pocket and took out a small object that gleamed gold in the lamplight. Sir Henry took it to the nearest lamp and scrutinised it closely. "'Good Lord!' he exclaimed. "'The stone is some kind of polished cabochon, perhaps a ruby or, or a garnet.' "'It is the jewel of seven stars,' Abdul wailed. "'It is evil. The hand must not have it.' "'Do not distress yourself further,' said Sir Henry. "'Come with us, so you will not be alone.' I must admit that at this point I felt admiration for Sir Henry. The mark of a man's character, after all, is how he treats the powerless. We went back into the living room. As I walked over to the fireplace, I thought I heard a scuttling sound like a rat. I glanced around, fingering my revolver, but saw nothing. "'Your man filched a piece of jewellery, that is all,' said Holmes, as the others entered the room. He thought he was acting for the best, though one might ask Abdul— why you did not simply throw the ring overboard on your voyage home. Abdul collapsed into a chair, averting his eyes. I tried, Mr. Holmes, I tried, but the evil one, she would not let me. Every time I tried to cast it from me, she appeared like a jinni and gazed into my soul with those eyes, and I was afraid to offend the sorceress. Sir Henry had been turning the ring over in his hand. I asked if I could see it. The ring was small, wrought from gold, and the red stone seemed unremarkable. But as I examined it more closely, I saw there were seven tiny indentations in the polished surface. These caught the light as I turned the ring in my fingers. Seven stars, I remarked. These are the formation we call the plough today, or Charles's Wayne. It is instantly recognisable. Sir Henry stared at me, as if I'd said something remarkable, his eyes almost popping out of his head. Then, without a word, he grabbed the ring back in a rather rude fashion and held it close to the lamp again. "'Good God!' he exclaimed. "'You are right, Doctor. "'The stars of Ursa Major are in their correct positions in the night sky.' Holmes looked puzzled. I, too, did not grasp what the man was driving at. "'Don't you see?' Sir Henry went on, holding up the ring. Four thousand years ago, in the Egyptian Old Kingdom, "'those seven stars were in different positions. "'The stars move, gentlemen. "'Very slowly, but they move. "'Our astronomers only recently discovered the fact, "'using modern telescopes and other instruments.' But here is a jewel created in the Bronze Age that depicts those seven stars as they are now, in the modern era. How likely is that to be a coincidence, Mr. Holmes? I prefer coincidence to magic, Sir Henry, replied Holmes. And isn't the more rational explanation that the jewel was created recently and is a simple forgery? I began to object that if it was newly made, it could hardly have been placed in a sealed tomb. But then I saw the flaw in that argument. It assumed honesty on the part of the Egyptian servant who had already confessed to a deception. As if reading my mind, Abdul, who had been prevailed upon to sit by the fire, looked up and spoke. "'I did not lie, gentlemen,' he said quietly. "'I found it in the tomb. It is the jewel of seven stars.' 
That's good enough for me, said Sir Henry. Besides, what would be the point of such an elaborate trick, Holmes? There my friend was stumped. The entire story of the ring, the hand, and the burning room seemed to serve no sane purpose, unless one accepted that the legends and the folk tales about Nitocris were essentially true, and the marks on Abdul's throat were hard to explain except in terms of an actual assault. Yet still I hesitated to challenge Holmes directly. While I never considered myself a fool, I was always acutely aware that my intellect could never match his. Then another point occurred to me. Did you break the box? I asked the Egyptian. I do not think so, Doctor, but my mind is so clouded. One moment I was unpacking Sir Henry's things, the next the box was on the floor, broken open. I, I may have dropped it. This, Holmes said firmly, is what happens when superstition takes hold of men's minds. I believe, Sir Henry, that your man here was so obsessed with the legend that he may have unwittingly created those marks on his own throat. There are some precedents, such as religious stigmata, mind over matter, a form of self-hypnosis. Sir Henry and I both began to object to this explanation, but Holmes cut us off with a sharp gesture. And the hand itself, before you ask, has probably been secreted somewhere in this room, or simply thrown out of the window. I will, Sir Henry, pay you the courtesy of not calling your servant a conscious liar, merely a superstitious man possessed by a delusion. We can do nothing about the hand, regardless, but we can at least take the ring back to our lodgings in Sebra, removing one object of this unhealthy obsession. Sir Henry? The archaeologist seemed reluctant to part with such a fascinating find. I saw Holmes keenly observing the other man and realised it was a test. Did Sir Henry believe in the legend? It seemed that he did, as he sighed and handed the ring to my friend. Holmes looked at it again, then passed it to me. Why not take care of this trinket, Watson? You seem rather taken with it. And then, I think, we can wish you adieu for the evening, Sir Henry. I slipped the ring into my pocket. Abdul seemed relieved to see it in my possession. But as we were leaving, he touched my arm and spoke urgently. Be on your guard. She is cunning. We made our way back to the bear, a fine old inn looking out over the sea, and discussed the case over brandy in our private sitting-room. Holmes felt the affair was probably over, and was now of little interest. I agreed, but with less confidence. However, I spoke cautiously about the enduring risk from assassins. My friend was dismissive, arguing Sir Henry should simply stay at a safe distance from the Karim troop. Aha! But I forgot the enchanted hand of Nitocris, he added, chortling as he filled his pipe. Might it not strike in the night? I did not rise to the bait. Instead, I got up and excused myself, saying I had had a long day, and felt like an early night. So after wishing Holmes good night, I went up to my room and was soon in bed. As often happens, though, I found it difficult to sleep in unfamiliar surroundings. I got up to retrieve a book from my bag and heard an odd scuttling sound. I thought of mice and made a note to mention it to the landlord. Then I went back to bed and started to read. I deliberately brought a rather dull novel, and it had the desired effect. I was soon yawning, and my eyelids grew heavy. I set the book aside, doused my candle, and pulled up the covers. It seemed that only a few moments had passed, however, when I found myself awake again, and frozen in trepidation. Something was crawling up my leg. Half asleep and in blind panic, I kicked out and sat up, flinging back the covers. The curtains were open, and the little moonlight illuminated the bedroom. I could just make out a form like an immense black spider wriggling on its back. Then it flipped over with horrifying agility and began to scuttle towards me again. I flung myself out of bed and fell heavily on my back. My jacket was on the bedside chair. I groped for my revolver, thinking to beat the thing to death with the butt. John! The voice, so familiar and so well-beloved, stopped me dead. Mary stood over me, gazing down at me. The moonlight somehow became stronger at that moment, so that I could make out her lovely face, her gentle smile, those eyes full of concern for me. I think I stammered her name. Part of me knew that this could not be real, that I was being deceived. But I missed her so much. I hoped against hope that her spirit might be with me. It is she who lets you see me and hear me, and more. She knelt down by me. Behind her I could see another woman, beautiful and imperious in the pale light. I think I cried out at that. I heard something fall from the bed and strike the carpet with a thud. I flinched, but Mary reached out and laid a calming hand upon my cheek. My beloved spoke again. John, 
Help her return to this world. She is not evil. She only wishes to bring harmony to mankind. And if you help her, I will come to you again sometimes. She gives you her word. I thought of the dream I'd had after I first touched the hand. I thought of the ring and grasped in a vague way that its removal impaired some grand ancient plan. I felt revulsion at the thought of participating in any kind of pagan magic, least of all that which might bring a brilliant but evil being back into the world. But that was nothing to the yearning I felt, the wish that I could make this moment last forever. Set her free, John, so that I may come to you again. My will crumbled. I dropped the revolver and reached into my other coat pocket and took out the jewel of seven stars. I felt the severed hand clamber onto my lap, but was indifferent to the horror. I placed the ring on the sixth finger and saw my Mary smile, and then there was a great flare of golden light, like a silent explosion. The next thing I knew, Holmes was kneeling at my side, his face lit by lamplight. I saw, not for the first time, real concern for me on his hawk-like features. I think I spoke my wife's name. Holmes glanced around, picked up my revolver, and placed it on the chair. "'Come, old friend,' he said, helping me up. "'Let's get you back into bed.' I babbled something about Nitocris being free, and that I was sorry for being so weak. Holmes, speaking more gently than usual, told me not to talk, but simply to rest until morning. Then he took his place by my bedside, and doused the lamp he'd brought. Eventually, I slept again. When I awoke to a bright April dawn, I struggled to make sense of what had occurred. It all seemed jumbled together in a dream or a nightmare. Holmes was gone, but returned soon with breakfast. "'Don't get used to this treatment, Watson,' he warned, setting the tray by me. "'You'll soon be your old self.' I sensed that he was waiting for some kind of explanation, but I could not give him one. In fact, as I picked at my toast and scrambled eggs, I struggled to focus on anything except the memory of the cool touch of Mary's fingers upon my cheek. Little else remains to be said of the case of the mummy's hand, except that, on the night of my strange visitation, a fisherman hauling his boat up the beach reported seeing a strange, intense light shine briefly from the window of the inn, and later he claimed and later he claimed he saw a tall woman in a pale dress walking on the sand. He called after her, but she disappeared. Then, in the light of his lamp, he insists he saw the mark of bare feet in the sand. He insists that there were six toes on each foot. The turning tide washed those prints away before anyone could confirm the man's story. But I believe it. Months have passed since my encounter at Sebra, and we're approaching the end of a troubled century. What lies ahead for me, for Holmes, for all mankind, I cannot help but think that Nitocris, now at large in a strange new world, must be biding her time. I only hope that the tales of her cruelty were false, or at least exaggerated. She might not use her powers to evil ends, but I cannot be sure. I doubt that I will ever be sure. Sometimes, when I am alone at night, I sense someone behind me. I hear what must be a footstep, feel the slight brush of delicate fingers against the nape of my neck, and I yearn for a voice that never speaks. I never turn around, never dare make sure, because if I do not look, I can go on believing that it is Mary there, watching over me. <laughs>